Hello, yes. everybody, and welcome. Rana Ayub is as uh, uh, an investigative reporter, an author. Uh, she is also a contributor to the Washington Post. Rana, it's good to talk to you again. Um, Hi, we're together. Maria. We were together at the launch of the 2020 World Press Freedom Index, and uh, tell tell us your reactions to this. Well, I actually was not the least bit surprised, certainly not surprised with the results in Asia, whether it's India, Pakistan or China. The fact that India came 142, slipping down to positions compared to last year. And it is ironic that the World Press Freedom Index has released the same week as uh, some of the bravest journalists in Kashmir have been arrested under terror charges. Uh, calling their stories fictitious and fake. Uh, Masrat Zera, Peer Zada Ashik, um, you know, student rights activists, um, students, journalism students. Uh, the fact that they've been arrested on terror charges for speaking the truth speaks volumes of where we are as the world's largest democracy. And that the world's largest democracy is in the bottom of the World Press Freedom Index should be uh, should be something that should worry us as a country because there is a crisis of the truth. Whether it was the Delhi carnage that took place two months ago, uh, which was stoked by members of the ruling party, the BJP and Mr. Modi's minister, and how it was given a communal twist by Indian journalists, a section of Indian journalists, to the coverage of the coronavirus, which has been made into something very Islamic, uh, mostly by a section of the Indian media. India Today, one of India's leading news channel, had a graphic running of a virus with a Muslim skull cap and saying that this was responsible for spreading the virus across the country. And day in, day out, you have television channels literally, literally speaking the language of the government. The Union Minority Affairs Minister of India called the virus uh, and called the spread the Talibanization of the virus by Indian Muslims and by the public. So I think what ministers do and what governments do is they extend their fascist propaganda even at times like this, whether you see that happening in Hungary, in the, you know, under Viktor Orban or in Trump. That's exact. And to see that being replicated in India, just exactly the way it is happening elsewhere in the world and you would know that you know that you have seen that in manila right and to see that being replicated when you are not able to give solutions to the poor and the migrant population and instead you feed them with an enemy and the enemy is the minority community and how do you do that you 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 silence journalists to speak the truth uh, you call them anti-nationals, um, you know, you, you question their sovereign sovereignty, you question their patriotism when they speak the truth. Especially at a time like this, most of the health journalists and people who are covering the COVID uh, pandemic and, and the medical facilities, many of them are writing for international publications. They've all been termed anti-nationals for what they believe is uh, delegitimizing and defaming India's position internationally. So it's, it's, it's like the playbook by which all autocrats play. And that's where Indian journalism is right now, that we, most journalists, are being forced to toe the line of the government. And when they do not, they risk losing their jobs. For instance, Siddharth Vardarajan, who runs the website Wire, has a case slammed against him two weeks ago by the UP police for what they believe was a fake story when Siddharth produced uh, the facts in the case. Uh, Ram Guha, India's leading intellectual, had to get, had to have, his, I mean, he go, uh, his, his column was removed from one of India's leading publications, the Hindustan Times, and he had to publish it on an independent website. So basically, Indian government does not like a media which is independent, especially at this time, which is so sensitive for the country. You have borne the brunt of these attacks on social media that have moved into the real world, right? Uh, you have described some of the uh, some of the the way India is moving against it. Uh, what are you doing? How are you continuing? How are you pushing back? How are you continuing your journalism? Maria, I am pushing back by speaking the truth a truth that is extremely unpopular and unpalatable for the government. 
uh, it is extremely difficult for journalists including independent journalists and freelance journalists to be doing the reporting that they are doing right now you know going and covering uh, the pandemic uh, i especially have been going to the slums where there are maximum number of covid positive cases i do not have any camera person at my disposal i do not have any health you know any any safeguards any protective gear at my disposal i don't have a car where the driver who will drive me to these locations so we are all doing this ourselves and then we come back to our family we don't have separate homes so i'm coming back to my family you know jeopardizing their health jeopardizing my own health and i'm not the only journalist who is doing this independent journalists are having it really tough at this point of time but um, for the last couple of years i mean i lost my um, after i resigned from tehelka in 2013 i was jobless till 2018 because no organization would touch me for my truth because there was an indirect warning that they could not hire me so i have been working independently till washington post got me on board last year and it has been slightly easier on me and i have been writing for international publications i have been doxed i have been i mean the the kind of hate campaigns against me um, there have been there have been unleashed by the state a pawned video with my image mobbed in it spread across the country i was doxed my, my you know getting getting hate mails hate messages on my phone getting nasty calls from callers every night saying that they would teach me a lesson um to somebody in the intelligence agency giving me a 31 page dossier saying each each page is for a member of my family so i know that my family is being scrutinized i know that my bank accounts are being scrutinized everything that i do every move that i make my phone calls are being tabbed but i do know that independent there is a price that you pay for independent journalism and you would know that better mario of all people <laughs> so so it's not so we are paying the price but i think when we go back to sleep every night it's a very it's a very sound sleep and we are answerable to our conscience and uh, it is not the most popular thing to do right now but this is my backlash against the backlash Uh, the RSF report actually talks about this decade that will will it's almost an existential decade. The challenges are going to increase for journalists around the world, and you described. We both know we've talked about this a lot a lot in terms yeah. of what we're facing, the challenges that we face. Where do you get the courage? Uh, what advice would you give to others who? you know may want to step back so you know i used to feel very victimized a couple of years ago saying why is this happening to me i had to go undercover or uh, do a sting operation on the government and then self publish my book and then nobody's willing to publish me so i used to feel like a victim all the time till such time that i actually went out to these international conferences and met journalists who are at the receiving end of the state and yeah and it felt like oh my god everybody's doing the same things so i'm not so i'm not an uh, an aberration this is this is a norm and journalists everywhere in the world are paying a price for speaking the truth so i drive my strength from these journalists who are fighting every day to retain the integrity of this profession i take strength from people of this country who have reposed their faith in me you know they send me mails and they send me messages on instagram whatsapp saying we are proud of what you're doing so that keeps your faith alive there's so many people who are praying for you and there's so many people i know there are people who abuse you all the time and are people do and there are people who send you death threats but there are equal number of people who love you and who support you including your family members who have been at the receiving end of this but they still support you and when you see the injustice around you you know that it's easy the easiest thing is to run away from the country take a fellowship uh, which i have been offered so many times take a fellowship move out of the country is the easiest thing to do but to stay back in your own country and fighting for what is right and fighting for your own people i think that's the right thing to do and the love that i get from people of this country who genuinely believe in the idea of the world's largest democracy or secularism i think that's what keeps me going the idea of justice keeps me going fantastic rana so let me toss some of the questions uh, i kind of threw some of them in the questions i asked you but there were so many questions that were posed uh, and there were several to you so let me give you uh, let me read it out to you right um, the media gag on reporting in kashmir 
you talked about this already recently, a female photojournalist been booked under the anti-terror laws, uh, done nothing, India has done nothing to curb this executive misuse of powers under the constitution. What right. is the World Press Freedom Community doing to tackle these situations without undermining the sovereignty of respective countries? So I'll say I'll, I'll I'll answer this giving my example, and you would know that when when you when there was a porn video made of me, and I was my images were thrown out across all tel all you know all phones in India, and my I was doxxed and I was getting rape threats and death threats. I remember when six UN special rapporteurs wrote to the Indian government to protect my safety. Uh, the Indian government did not take any cognizance of it, but it I mean till today they have. They did register a case uh, in under pressure, but there has been no progress in the investigation, despite me calling the agencies time and again. So I do know that when the UN says something or when RSA say, say something or other journalism organizations say something, it does add to some kind of pressure, although it does not reflect on the ground in terms of security for us. So whether it is you know Masarat Zehra or uh, or Pirzada Ashik, the fact that the international community is watching uh, is an, is in a way a big support for these people. And I think it's about especially in Kashmiri journalists. I think they have been telling the most unpopular stories for decades, and they are the bravest journalists that I have seen. I remember when I went with Dexter Filkins of the New Yorker and traveled to Kashmir incognito and. You know, when we went undercover and when we went to hospitals to cover what's happening in Kashmir, the lockdown, and I was questioned, my national, my patriotism was questioned. So Kashmiri journalists have to face this day in, day out. So it's about time that organizations like RSF, CPJ, IWMF, everybody really has to pull in their resources and tell these journalists that they are needed, that they're valued, that they're respected, and that these organizations have their back. Fantastic, fantastic. Rana, we, the global community hopefully is coming together, right? And hopefully we stand up, we continue standing up. Thank you so much for your thoughts. Thanks so uh, much. Thank you. Hope we meet in the real world soon. I know, hopefully. See you soon. We've been Love speaking so with well. Rana Ayub. Uh, bye. And bye. Bye-bye.